Okay. Um, well, actually, before I start this presentation, I would like to say um, one thing. And we were talking about, someone mentioned the word adversarial. Was that Ben yesterday mentioned adversarial? Right. And, um, right now, we are in a situation um, in which we don't have an agreement with Elsevier. But I would like to clarify the OA 2020, which is the initiative that I helped to coordinate at the Max Planck Digital Library. OA 2020, uh, actually, we're not, we don't, we like journals. <laughs> we recognize that publishers do you know, a very important um, piece of work for science and research. And so I, I don't want you know, to transmit this, uh, this you know, adversarial um, aspect so much. We're trying to find a way to transition the journals you know, that our, our researchers know and love to open access. Okay? There are some strategies that would say, no, simply, we just cancel. We just cancel, and we're not interested in transitioning. But our researchers are looking to us to transition journals, OK? Um, so now I'm going to talk to you. OA 2020 is really about the motivation for taking today's scholarly journals and transitioning them to open access. There's another initiative that um, my colleagues at the Max Planck Digital Library helped to coordinate, and that is the ESAC initiative. And I want to tell you a little bit about it, because it gets back um, to precisely the point of you are not alone, right? We are all in this together. So this is nothing new. This is just a graphic. It's actually taken from um, the Association of Research Libraries in the United States. I think the situation here, considering, um, considering also your currency fluctuation is much worse. This is just a graphic illustrating the cost, the, 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 the highest line that you see there is you know, the expenditures for um, electronic resources, particular, in particular journals. And then, again, the, it, looking at the US, the red line is uh, your consumer price index over the past years. And you see how you know, the cost of subscriptions has grown way out of proportion, right? This is a situation that we are all in, some more than others, again, because of fluctuation. This is nothing new to us. Now, I would like to talk to you about how it's possible for those subscription costs to have risen so much in the past years. And it really has to do with the lack of transparency. So I'm going to make you do a little work. I've been talking a lot, so you're going to help me in this process. We're going to use a, um, a framework called Porter's Five Forces Analysis um, to analyze scholarly, the scholarly publishing market today. And I hope Jeffrey, as an economist, will, <laughs> will forgive me this, you know, this, this um, excursion here. So the five forces analysis. Basically, Porter, um, an economist professor at Harvard Business School, he created this framework to understand the profitability of any given industry. Right. So before you go into an industry, you want to know how much your money you're going to make out of it and you know, look at it, analyze it in this fashion. So we will do this together in scholarly publishing. So Porter identified, identified five market forces. OK, so the first market force is industry rivalry. So where there is strong industry rivalry, then that will help to keep costs down, which of course, uh, keep prices down, which will of course influence the profitability, right? So if you think about, I don't know, the cost of a, your mobile telephone, your, your mobile device, not even a telephone, <laughs> comparing, you would cost compare, right? So industry rivalry, uh, Huawei, Samsung, and Apple. Now, we can go to a store and decide which mobile device we want to buy. But when we think about scholarly publishing, what do we think about industry rivalry? If we, if we, want, if we think about, let's just take the big three, Elsevier, Springer, and Wiley, do they compete with each other for our subscription dollars? I heard yes and no. No, who said no? Why not? Exactly, right. They have different journals. They have very unique portfolios. It's not like you can take one but not the other. Your users want them all, right? So there's, not good, there's no pressure here. They're, they're not competing with each other in the subscription world. So another market force that can influence pricing 
is the bargaining power of the suppliers. So in our world, who are the suppliers? Who's supplying the goods? The authors, exactly. So do the authors put much pressure on subscription prices? No, zero. Exactly. They don't know. They don't know how much it costs. You know, they're shocked when we tell them. So again, so here, this is a market force that's very, very low right now in, in the subscription world. The next market force is the threat of substitutes. So when we think about subscriptions, what could be a substitute to subscriptions? Okay. I want some products. What products could be a substitute? Or what things? Okay. <laughs> yes, you could consider Sci-Hub. Right. Some of the stuff I was talking about before, the academic social networks, for example, or institutional repositories. Right. Okay. So there we see, we saw in the graphic that I showed before, there's increasing, you know, availability through, via these alternative sources. But maybe we're still not there to, to, to walk away completely and forget subscriptions altogether. So there might be a little pressure. It's maybe growing, but it's still not really strong right now. Another market force is the threat of new entrants. So who are the new entrants in scholarly publishing? OK, open access journals, right? New open access journals, new open access publishers, new open access platforms. But we heard yesterday that you know, the, it takes time for new journals to build their reputation, right? And also, you know, they, these new open access initiatives, they, they cost money, of course. And right now, library budgets are kind of all tied up in subscriptions. So we don't, it's not easy for us to take some of that money and put it over to invest in these new systems. All right, so we don't have much pressure there. And finally, the last market force is the bargaining power of the buyers. Who are the buyers in this situation, in subscriptions? Yes, that's us. <laughs> Do you feel like you have much you know, power to influence the price? No. Why not? And there's a key reason why well, I've written it there for you. I probably shouldn't have written it. One of the biggest reasons why you don't have market pressure is the lack of transparency. Transparency. So you, know, you have license agreements that have non-disclosure clauses in them. So you're not allowed. It's not like you go to the store, as we said before, and you can compare how much does it cost at this shop to buy an iPhone, how much does it cost at that shop to buy a different you know, device. And you, you see that. You see what the costs are. But right now, and that's public to everyone. Everyone is, goes to the same shop, right? But in the subscription world, we don't have this transparency around the pricing. Um, Sandlick knows what Sandlick pays, but Sandlick doesn't know what the, my library pays or what California pays, and without this ability to compare the cost, there's, there's, no, there's no power there, right? So this, this is the situation we are in. This is how the costs were, you know, this is how publishers are able to, you know, have this market power around subscriptions. And this has gotten, this is a really interesting graphic. Um, the situation is therefore this. This is a, a report done by the European University Association because they are increasingly um, beginning to negotiate transformative agreements. They've been talking for a few years about, um, about these big deal packages and the costs involved. And of course, you're not, they're not allowed to share the pricing because of the non-disclosure agreements. But they have been able to do some analysis, and this is a, a graphic from one of their most recent reports, and they looked at the five largest publishers, okay, the, or the, lar the publishers that took the largest share of their budgets in their subscription prices. And what you have here, are, you know, on, along the left are the different um, uh, university, uh, so each each of these re represents really a country, okay? So it would be like the, the Sandlick of, of the various different countries in Europe. And across the right uh, is um, the number of people that need to work for one year, given a certain GDP per capita, in order to reach the same monetary value as the cost with the big five publishers in that country. 
So it's a little complicated, you know, so up, up as many as 3,000 people, you know, on down to you, something very little. So what, what we're trying to say here is even controlled for GDP, you've got a huge variance in the prices that people are paying for subscriptions to the same content, okay? So this is, this is the result of this lack of transparency. Now we also know that open access is growing. Okay, now I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about motivation, motivation, why I think libraries need to get involved in licensing around transformative agreements and open access. Um, it is related to the cost, of course. So we know that, you know, these are the 20, this is already old data from 2016, but if you were do, to do the same um, picture this year or for 2018, it might be, it would be a slight variance, but not a lot. Um, these are the 20 largest journals in the world. And we see that of these, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of them, those highlighted in gray, are complete open access journals, okay? Now, when we think open access, um, we have to also realize, though, that a lot of these are published by subscription publishers. And the costs involved in these open access journals, so no longer associated with access, but associated with publishing, is left to the individual researchers in many cases, right? So Springer Nature, their, or the, the, the journal, uh, the NPG journal, Scientific Reports, it's a huge journal, it's actually surpassed PLOS One now, and the costs involved there are costs that individual researchers are simply paying to get published in that journal, right? There's no one there to mediate that cost or to negotiate better arrangements, better conditions. This is something that I think we, we should be aware of. And then another point around cost is without this oversight in the cost of open access publishing, here's the situation that we have. This is a graphic from um, the consulting agency Delta Think, who are analyzed you know, the costs in scholarly publishing. And um, again, I'm not an economist, but this is what I see in this graphic. We have, what, what, what this shows is the cost of publishing an article open access related to the SNP, the source normalized impact per paper. So the SNP, which is on the left, this increasing, the higher the SNP, the greater the quality. Over on the, bot on, the, on the bottom, we have the cost involved, so the cost of publishing that article. So the yellow dots are articles in gold open access journals, and the green are in hybrid. So it's a subscription journal, but authors are allowed to publish open access, particularly if they have a mandate, you know, for example, like Welcome Trust that mandates open access publishing. Now, if we take, look at everything below three, of course we have the outliers up at the top, you know, the green, the hybrid, those are really high quality journals, you know, very few and far between, right? So that's, that, those are outliers. Let's look at the bulk, the bulk of the, of the, if we look at the bulk below three, for example, the quality of the SNP of three, we see a huge clustering, right? It's all down below three. The lower cost are the gold, and at higher cost are the green. But what, and in, in fact, this is, you know, um, the, the, the Delta think have actually given us the numbers on top there. The average list APC is $1,600, but in hybrid, it's $2,900. This, this variance is also confirmed through the Open APC initiative. You might know about Open APC. If not, I can talk to you about it later. They're also tracking the costs of publishing. And their, you know, their figures are cost of um, per article, average per article cost for gold is 4, 000, almost 1,500 and hybrid 2,445. Now, um, I, what I see here is all of this clustering below the SNP of three. To me, it's not, or at least in my library, we look at it, it's not really justified, right? The quality indicators, they're very similar, and yet the hybrid journals are costing much more than publishing in the gold journals. Yeah, this is, for us, this is a call to action as libraries. We want to get out in front of that. You know, why are, we, why are our researchers paying so much more to publish in a hybrid journal? Th those costs need to come down. Right? There's, there's no justification for this higher cost if we're looking at quality as, as an indicator. 
So let's look at South publishing in South Africa for a moment. Um, this is a snapshot of a data set. Some colleagues um, who collaborate with the ESAC initiative have, are working on, and they would like to make it openly available a little bit later this year. We're like doing you know, some, some cleanup of the data. But this data set is South African articles published between 2014 and 2017, so just a good chunk of data to work with, and um, as in indexed in Web of Science. Okay, so this is obviously a subset of South African publishing. I don't want to say it's everything, but let's just look at this for a moment. Um, and the reason I want to dig into this is because this is data that we as librarians need to know. We need to know more about publishing of our institutions, right? Um, you can see, I don't know how well it is, to see, how easy it is to see. The, the largest publisher is Elsevier. Then you have Informa, which is Taylor and Francis, Springer Nature, Wiley. Where's my glass here? AOSIS, yes. So that's Homegrown Initiative, yes. Okay, so just to give you, you know, a picture, this is what publishing your, your representation in Web of Science looks like. Now I'm going to dig into that a little bit more. Taken from another perspective, okay, now we're looking at it in a pie chart form, okay, and then I'm going to move forward from, from that. You've got um, all the top here. This kind of actually confirms um, the 80-20 rule, right? You've got the, the most of your publishing, publishing is happening with a, a relatively small group of publishers. Now, the next graphic is looking at, of that set, what is closed, what's behind a paywall, We've got 24,000 some articles behind the paywall, and you see again the publishers. Yeah, and so if I'm a, if I'm a research director, I'm like looking at, look at all that wonderful content that the rest of the world doesn't get to see unless they pay exorbitant amounts if they can afford it, right? Now let's look at the open access. Are, are we not sure of this? Okay. All right. So as I said, this is stuff that needs to get cleaned up. So I apologize. Um, here we have the open. This, um, and this is um, open as, as in as much as we can tell also through um, Crossref. Now what I have interesting here though, and what I wanted to show you is, so this is around 7,500 articles, but there's this chunk here, for example, Springer Nature, right? That's a big chunk of open access publishing. And what I want us to realize is that's money, actually. That's money being paid to publish there by our researchers with no one to help them in you know, getting a little bit of oversight of the costs involved. Okay. All right, now I'm going to move into how, so what can we do about this lack of transparency? Um, I just mentioned very quickly earlier Open APC, and I can talk to you about that separately in a little bit, but I want to tell you what ESAC is trying to do. ESAC is an initiative open to anybody. It has a website. Everything I'm going to show you is freely available. It's basically a community of um, libraries and consortia around the world who are sharing information about um, managing the costs of publishing, article processing charges, uh, the workflows involved in it. It's very practical, the workflows involved in it. And now it's also expanded into um, managing the processes and workflows around transformative agreements, okay? So one of the features on the website, I'm just gonna show you a few of them, um, and so it has a website, it has a listserv, anyone can freely write, ask questions, share information. We have workshops once a year to talk about some of the problems that are most pressing that we all have. One of the things we have is a market watch. So we wanna see, we've, we have the market watch for um, three publishers now and we're trying to integrate more data to, to illustrate. We want to see how the publishers, subscription publishers, how well are they doing in their transition to open access? So this is a, a flourish view. What you see in gray is the closed, and then the orange, of course, is open access, and, and the lighter orange are hybrid. So we can track you know, how well are they doing in this transition. They say they're open to transitioning. Well, let's see how much they are. We're also capturing the price points of their APCs. That's there at the bottom. So we can see, um, yeah, we can compare the cost. On average, looking at the Open APC initiative, pulling that information here, what does it cost to publish open access or hybrid in a journal by Springer Nature? So we're trying to create more transparency. 
ESEC also has um, discussed some general guidelines. So if you're thinking about negotiating a transformative agreement, something to transition, um, these are some guidelines that generally we all agree to. They're written on the website, you can reference them. Plan S, Coalition S, actually references the ESEC guidelines as being you know, the, 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 the point of reference when thinking about compliancy. Transformative agreements are temporary and transitional. Authors retain exclusive rights to their works. Agreements must be transparent. Agreements are meant to constrain costs in scholarly communication and foster equity in scholarly publishing. They should also govern service and workflow requirements. So this is now sort of a standard. What we're trying to do is build a standard of libraries, you know, the standards that we dictate, that we want. Um, we also capture community guidelines. So as different consortia around the world establish their own guidelines for negotiating, we link out to these and you see uh, the United Kingdom, yes, journal agreements must be transitional. We've said this. Um, in Southern Europe, in Japan, I'm just gonna flip through them, in the US now, you know, all of these are part of the ESAC community and we are all you know, sharing these guidelines to make us stronger as a community as a whole. Another tool is the ESAC registry. So when a consortium or library negotiates a transformative agreement, the objective is that it's fully transparent and you can look at the whole agreement online. In some cases, you know, we're not able to negotiate that yet. You know, we're, everyone, we, we move at our own pace. But what we can do is capture some information about the agreements. So, um, the, so libraries and consortia fill out a form on the ESAC website to share information about their agreement. And this is, so the registry, you can go and look and learn about the agreements in place. So some of the information that's captured are the costs. Does, um, how does the cost of the agreement relate with your previous subscription spend? And this is an example from an agreement from Slovenia. They've managed an agreement. The, the costs are actually in the range of subscription. So now they're getting open access using their, their spend from subscriptions. That spend was fully converted to open access. Um, an overall assessment. Yes, it's a good example of a clear and transparent publishing agreement. So you can dig into these agreements and learn about them, right? How big they are, the costs involved, what are the workflow? Are they, you know, are the publishers meeting up to the workflows requirements? And of course there you also find information on the workflows because workflows are, I mean, it's, it's a complicated thing to move to tracking individual articles. But the good news is that you are not alone. We have recommendations and standards already in place. Agreed, um, the, the first, agreed also with publishers, so they're fully aware of this as well. Everything from identifying your authors, like how do you identify an author as being part of your institution? You might use different parameters, whether the IP range that they are in when they submit their article. Maybe it's the email address. Um, Maybe it's the statement of the author's affiliation. I mean, these are there are questions that need to be dealt with, but the good news is that we are a community that have already been dealing with them and can share information on how to. And sort of, I'm almost at the close here. I wanted to say, I showed you the graphic before from the European University Association illustrating this, um, this wide range in cost for the different institutions. So as they are trying to address this, I think this is something that's useful for all of us. Um, the recommendations are we must exert market pressure in proportion to our financial investment. I mean, th this is our money we are investing here and we need to be more aggressive in how we leverage our investments. And given the entity of our investments, um, the, the negotiations they need, political attention, like from our rectors and operational attention. So it's something that we have to work together, both on a political level and on an operational level. We need all of our stakeholders involved. There must be transparency in the agreements and institutions must improve their ability to monitor the, co monitor the costs. Essential. So if you're not tracking now how much your art authors are publishing, what they are paying in terms of open access publishing charges, we need to start thinking about what we can do to start tracking. Do we need to create a fund code to, 
to have them cite whenever they pay an invoice. Um, just one possible solution. The transition, transformative agreements are not easy, but we have some first movers and they have created um, some standards, they've created um, best practice, so things are getting easier. You are not alone and we invite you, yes, to be part of this transformation. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's a question. <laughs> I'll, I'll have a go at it. Um, sure. could, you, could you comment a little bit on the resources that um, uh, Max Planck has poured into managing this? Because I've heard that uh, the Wiley Agreement, for instance, is, is um, it's pretty comprehensive <laughs> considering the number of institutions and in the, it's an entire country that you're right, trying right. to uh, get a grip on. C could you comment a little bit on what kind of resources it's taken? Yeah, so um, the Wiley Deal Agreement that we heard about yesterday, all of a sudden the Max Planck Digital Library, which already was managing simply you know, a central agreement for their 80 institutes, all of a sudden with the Wiley Deal Agreement, has to handle 700 institutions across Germany. So that was a huge jump for us. And I mean, it's been a process very much in collaboration with the colleagues at Wiley, you know, working out all of the workflows and processes. And I have to, you know, commend, yes, Wiley for this great collaboration. Um, in terms of our own resources, resources at the library, um, we have had to expand our team slightly. I think there were two positions that we needed to address in-house and we also took advantage um, I think a bit of some outsourcing as well. Yeah, but um, yeah it's been it's been six months and we're about to go live any minute with, with the hybrid publishing component but I think we're pretty much there. Yeah, but again so this it was an investment on our part but the good news is that you know the great work that is being done to as publishers embrace the transition to open access and you know, understand the, the we, as we both understand um, the needs, it's going to make it easier for those who follow, right? It's, yeah.